Copyright Stanford University. All rights reserved.
Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to the uh, fifth, already the fifth, Shumway Annual Lectureship. Uh, and, you know, it's hard to believe that it's been six years since uh, Dr. Shumway was with us, and it, uh, it feels like only yesterday. I'm sure tomorrow when we're out on the golf course, we'll, uh, we'll remember some, some, uh, some of the quotes. Hi, Ed. It's great to see you here, man. And so many other people, Joan, there, there are so many people that uh, we don't get to see a lot. Uh, so we, we made a good choice in uh, asking Bill to come back. It's like old home week for him. And uh, Bill, it's a, it's a real pleasure to have you here to give this lecture. Uh, There's so many people that are deserving of this, but certainly you're right at the top of the list. So Dr. Baumgartner, um, he's a Kentucky boy. I don't know what happened to him though. He lost his southern accent, but I haven't been able to quite get rid of mine. But uh, uh, Bill has been uh, one, of the, one of the people in our field and certainly in the Stanford community that, that I have, uh, have grown to have great respect for and, and uh, uh, for his friendship and also his mentorship, even though he's on the other coast. He's, he's certainly given me great advice over the years. He, uh, he went to, to college at Xavier uh, along with uh, Dr. Fogarty and then uh, got his MD degree from University of Kentucky and then came here to do his uh, general surgery and cardiothoracic surgical training. Uh, Dr. Oberhelman's here, and I'm sure that uh, there's, there's, there's legendary uh, uh, stories about you, Bill, obviously about Dr. O, but that, uh, that you actually did a gastric operation on a patient in North ICU or something like that one day, before you, Tom, before your time, but uh, uh, you can confirm that maybe later. Uh, he, he stayed on faculty here for a year or two, and then uh, he and Bruce went back to Hopkins and, and built uh, what we, of course, like to refer to as the Stanford of the East. Uh, Bruce um, eventually came back home. Uh, Bill stayed and has uh, obviously had a great career. He, he led the transplant program, and then uh, when Bruce left was the division chief, and uh, uh, Betsy must be uh, a very understanding woman because it seems as though like every 10 years, he takes on a new challenge. So from being division chief, uh, he took on uh, the challenge of being the, the senior dean for clinical affairs at Hopkins, a, a role that he still has. Uh, and then in 2009, he became the uh, executive director for the American Board of Thoracic Surgery and, and basically commutes between Baltimore and Chicago a couple of days a week. So. Um, uh, Bill, it's, uh, it's wonderful to have you here. We look forward to golf tomorrow and look forward to your, uh, to your talk today. Bill's going to share uh, his insights uh, from his research uh, uh, domain, which is uh, neurological uh, function and uh, surrounding neurological injury around cardiac surgery. He's, he's uh, now had uh, over 20 years of continuous NIH funding uh, for this program, and he tells me that he's going to renew one more time, uh, sort of like Craig. Craig uh, made it to about 30 years and finally closed his lab recently. So, so Bill, uh, congratulations on a great career and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Well, thank you very much, Bobby, for those uh, kind words of introduction and for uh, the really nice invitation to be here. It is, it is like coming home. Uh, and uh, I've had a, uh, always had a great time here. I have such a fond remembrance of, uh, of this uh, institution. And to be the uh, Shumway uh, visiting professor is particularly a, a really wonderful honor. And, uh, I look back and you know, uh, most of you wouldn't, wouldn't remember this, but uh, when I came here, uh, I came in general surgery. Uh, I actually didn't know Dr. Shumway uh, at that time, and I came in general surgery. And my first month, uh, we, we started in late June, and so we transitioned, uh, and uh, Phil Caves was the outgoing chief resident, and, and Don Watson, uh, was the uh, junior resident. And my first month then was on cardiac, and in those days, uh, Dr. Shumway had the intern scrub with him on every case. And so uh, that was it, I got hooked. And uh, I still remember, still remember walking, going over, because I went on to orthopedics at that time, and 
uh, I wanted to go talk to him to tell him I really wanted to be a cardiac surgeon. And I went over and I w saw Rita, uh, who uh, was his assistant, and she said, oh, no, you don't make appointments with Dr. Shumway. I said, no, no. She said, just come over. He always comes by in between cases. So I did. I walked in, nervous as can be, and uh, said, geez, I'd really, really love to be trained here. And he said, sure, Bill, we'll do it. And I shook his hand, and I was out of there. I mean, that it was a very quick, as, as he, his yearbook says, he is a man of few words, but great meaning. And so I was particularly uh, honored uh, to be asked to come back. Uh, <clears throat> he, in many ways, was, uh, he was a marvelous uh, teacher in the operating room. I think he taught us a philosophy that first assistance is really the uh, best way, and I think his legacy has been now transferred uh, numerous times for all the people we trained, and our trainees hopefully will carry that uh, legacy. Uh, he's, he's recognized, uh, I think, in a wonderful way by the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation as being the honorary lifetime president. Uh, which really uh, serves uh, serves it well serves him well because uh, he truly was and is the father of uh, transplantation. Uh, I don't hit, you know always coming back to Stanford. It's hard to either tell a story about Dr. Shumway or show a picture that uh, people haven't already heard. Uh, but uh, you can see this is a shot that uh, was shortly after. Uh, being an intern uh, during this particular time. And uh, uh, was, uh, I always uh, uh, remarked uh, that he, as a teacher, would uh, tell you things and you would learn things, but you wouldn't actually recognize that they were uh, some really profound things until years later. Uh, and I, one example uh, of that is, you know, he, he used to, create, or he did create this atmosphere in the operating room that uh, was extremely collegial and congenial. And, you know, if things got tense, uh, he would uh, always tell a joke. And he would, in his famous words that I think all of us still remember and have used, you know, just keep operating was what he used to say. And uh, Actually, during the whole time I was here, I've only, I only saw him actually upset uh, one time in the whole, whole time I was here. And uh, w we can talk later about what that was about, but uh, <laughs> he, had, he had one, though, he had, did, he had one funny idiosyncrasy, and that was he believed that sneezing was a voluntary reflex. And, and for all of us who scrubbed uh, with him, uh, he, you would go through all kinds of facial contortions underneath your mask because he thought that that was bad because even though you had a mask on, sneezing would, would uh, cause germs to, to uh, go out. And so no one, I, in fact, the whole time, I, for the three years I was with him, I never sneezed once. Uh, and I, I think the majority of us never sneezed at all. Uh, but one day, one day, those of you who, who knew him, he sneezed, in the, he sneezed in the operating room. And we all, you know, it was silence for about two seconds and then everybody broke up. So <clears throat> about, uh, Oh, a week or 10 days later, there appeared on room 13 door going into the operating room a small plaque that specified the date and the time when Dr. Shumway sneezed in the operating room. <laughs> and I won't identify who the culprit uh, was, but I believe he's in the room. Uh, today, he, he was, he and I were uh, co-residents together, and his initials are A-R. <laughs> but it was one of the funnier things. So, again, uh, bringing slides here is always difficult, uh, but I think there, there's uh, this one I don't think most people have seen. Uh, when Bruce and I went back to Hopkins in 1982, uh, a year later, we invited Dr. Shumway to come back and be the Blaylock visiting professor. And this is a picture in uh, Betsy and our home. 
and with Dr. Shumway and Bruce. And then the fellow in the middle, uh, most of, some of you will know, but if you don't, that's uh, Vince Scott. Vince Scott was trained by Dr. Lillehi in Minnesota, was with Dr. Shumway uh, during that uh, really exciting time, and uh, was chief of cardiac surgery at Hopkins from 65 uh, to 82 when Bruce and I came there. And uh, I show this, Betsy and Nan would absolutely shoot me for showing this picture. Uh, but I show it because we invited uh, Sarah Shumway uh, to come up because her dad was going to be there. And it turned out that two years later in 1985, uh, Sarah came to do a cardiothoracic residency uh, with uh, Bruce and, and me. So there's a lot of connections. Uh, I picked this uh, topic because I've actually had a great time. Bobby said uh, that we've had this uh, NIH-funded research now for, for close to 20 years, and it's been a really a great fun thing for me. I still, uh, even though I stopped operating a couple years ago, I still run the cardiac surgery research lab, and uh, the residents all rotate through it. Uh, and I've had a great time learning a number of things that uh, I really uh, knew very little about uh, to begin with. The, uh, my pers the person who works with me has been a great uh, co-investigator is uh, Michael Johnston. Uh, Mike is a professor of neurology and pediatrics at the Kennedy Krieger Institute, which is literally right next to Johns Hopkins Hospital. And uh, he and I have uh, been collaborators on this, uh, again, for close to 20 years. Uh, but probably the most important thing in the lab, uh, and I think it was true with Dr. Shumway and uh, his idea, is that it trains residents. We've had, as you can see, 23 residents who have rotate through the lab. Uh, and, and those residents have all contributed to, to both the papers uh, and the presentations. I want to just acknowledge some of you. You can see the residents are on the left-hand side. Many of those uh, are in academic positions uh, around the country, and a uh, number of them are in leadership positions. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have uh, a single neuropathologist, uh, Juan Troncoso, be with us for these 20 years uh, looking at uh, our sections of the brain. Uh, luckily, also, these two individuals uh, have been with us. Bruce uh, knows very well. They were hired virtually after we got there in 82, so they've been with us for that period of time. Vince, while he was at, uh, while he was at Hopkins, uh, he's in Charlottesville right now, but while he was there, was really a, a great uh, person to bounce ideas off of. And then we have a relationship with the uh, University of Florida who are really experts in biomarkers uh, when it comes to brain trauma. And Gordon Tomaselli is the chief of cardiology at uh, Hopkins and uh, also happens to be this year the president of the American Heart Association. But he was very instrumental in helping us uh, get the canine genome that I'll, I'll talk to you in a bit. Uh, the Kennedy Krieger Group, uh, they do all the analyses for us and uh, have been great, uh, as I said, led by Michael Johnson. I will uh, talk a bit about adult neurology in, in just a minute. So we got interested in this because it still is a problem today. It's one of the most significant causes of morbidity and mortality in our patients who undergo cardiac surgery. And, one of the ideas was that if you could figure out the mechanisms of cell injury related to hypothermic circulatory arrest, so literally what we use today for a number of aortic procedures and sometimes for neonatal cardiac surgery where you shut the pump off for a period of time, there's then no blood flow to the brain. We figured, we thought if you could actually figure out the mechanism that perhaps would be valuable for uh, other uh, cardiac surgery procedures that did not use hypothermic circuitry arrest. Uh, like a lot of things, and again, I think Dr. Shumway uh, would, would say that a lot of the ideas that came forward came, came by a resident. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, he, he would say, I know he would say uh, many of the ideas about heart transplantation uh, were uh, 
came about because of Ed Stinson, and then Phil Lawyer, and then Scott Mitchell when it comes to aortic work, and Craig Miller. Uh, it's just, uh, and then of course Bruce when it came to heart lung transplantation. Those ideas all came about uh, residents. And Mark was a resident on our lab for one year, and he came and said, you know, I'm very interested. He had a background in neuroanatomy and said, I'm very interested in looking at this. Do you want to give it a shot at doing this? And Because we were doing predominantly research in those days in heart preservation and lung preservation for transplantation purposes. Mark now has gone on, and he's a, a chief of cardiac surgery over in Dublin. And during his time in the lab, he developed the model and uh, we uh, had the first validation of what we call excitotoxicity in, in a large animal model of cardiopulmonary bypass and hypothermic circuitory arrest. <clears throat> and it had been demonstrated in smaller models and in cell culture, but had not really been validated in a large animal model. Uh, what it is, is a activation of what we call uh, glutamate or NMDA receptors. So, what happens is glutamate is a normal neurotransmitter in the brain. It's sort of equivalent to acetylcholine in the periphery. And under periods of stress with hypoxia and <clears throat> ischemia, the uptake mechanism for glutamate in the synapse back into the cell is an energy product. And when you have decreased blood supply, that pump quits working. So glutamate accumulates between the cells, and then it stimulates, overstimulates NMDA receptors. And these receptors are in specific areas of the brain, and they are involved in cognition, memory, and some in movement and sensation. The sort of very simple schematic that I think everyone knows, most strokes are caused by something breaking off from the heart or from <clears throat> the aorta uh, going to the brain, causing a stroke. But cardiopulmonary bypass, cir certainly circulatory arrest, uh, it causes sometimes a decrease in, relative decrease in blood flow to certain areas of the brain, uh, can then cause uh, hypoxic injury, and we believe it can turn on this, this concept, this phenomenon of excitotoxicity, and that, we believe, uh, can contribute to cognitive decline, uh, seizures, and then the sort of decreased level of consciousness that, that we see in our patients from time to time. They're slow to come off the ventilator, slow to wake up. Uh, we, we think that in part it is contributed uh, by excitotoxicity. So take it, take it back to your medical school days of neuroanatomy. The uh, areas of the brain that are particularly rich in these NMDA receptors are here, particularly the hippocampus, the limbic structures, and the basal ganglion. And as you can see, it sort of sits in, this, in the heart of the brain, the sort of soul of the brain is this area of the hippocampus that's demonstrated here. That area is really associated with memory and cognition. And that area has an overabundance of these NMDA receptors. So this cartoon kind of illustrates uh, what occurs if you develop hypoxia and ischemia. Uh, there is this uh, overaccumulation of glutamate because it can't get back into the cell due to a breakdown of the uptake system. It overstimulates the NMDA receptors on the surface of neurons. It causes the increase of calcium influx, which then causes a, an overabundance of phospholipases protein kinases, and nitric oxide synthase. And, that, and we were particularly interested in that uh, because it's neuronal nitric oxide synthase. And if you look down, what it does is it converts oxygen and arginine to citrulline and nitric oxide. And nitric oxide in the brain, in this model, is a very toxic substance. And in, just to tell you, in measuring it, we, you can't measure nitric oxide because its half-life is so very short. But it's converted to citrulline and nitric oxide in one-to-one -one quantities. So if you measure citrulline, it's an indirect measure, a measurement of nitric oxide. It then goes on and causes uh, cell death and by either apoptosis, a programmed cell death model, or by uh, frank necrosis. 
So our canine model that Mark uh, helped to develop really has to do with male hound dogs. Uh, they're all the same weight. Uh, they're particularly all of the same age because the NMDA receptors change over time. So they're all the same age. We, we use a closed model, so we don't manipulate the heart. Uh, the cannulation occurs always uh, peripherally in the femoral and the jugular vein. And uh, we cool them down to a tympanic temperature of 18 degrees. They have two hours. In, the, in our early model, we, we wanted to get a consistent injury. And two hours of hypothermic circulatory arrest does that. Uh, they're rewarmed and then they're sacrificed up to 72 hours. And we looked at them, histopathology was probably the, it's the gold, still the gold standard of, of whether or not a, uh, you're being successful in any kind of mitigation of neurologic injury by looking at the histology. Uh, we use autoradiography, which I'll show you. And then more recently, we've gotten into uh, looking at biomarkers and then genomics. So the original studies were all done with two hours of hypothermic circulatory arrest after being put on peripheral bypass. They're rewarmed, and then they're sacrificed at various times. Uh, during this period of time, we, we have two independent uh, individuals in the lab who look at the dogs and measure them against a Pittsburgh a score looking at cranial nerve function and a variety of scores for a neurologic score of uh, up to 100, uh, sort of like golf, the lower score, the better the dog is, the higher score, not so good. And histologic evaluation. In the more recent years, uh, we started to look at one hour of hypothermic circuit arrest, which is truly a much more clinically appropriate uh, model. And then we, also put in a, a group of dogs that just had cardiopulmonary bypass, no hypothermic, no ischemic event whatsoever, and then got into looking at, as I mentioned, biochemical work and genomic uh, analysis through microarrays. So our early experience of this canine model uh, was such that we could demonstrate a consistent neurologic deficit. The areas that in hypothermic circulatory arrest that are, are affected the most and consistently are those with the high abundance of NMDA receptors. So the hippocampus, the cerebellum, the basal ganglion. And the, we felt that this really, we re reproduced this in many ways, which I'll, I'll show you. Going back to this uh, cartoon, uh, we, in glutamate, we were able to measure uh, increased levels of glutamate in the brain during uh, periods of ischemia. Uh, you can uh, block the NMDA receptor and uh, preserve it, so to speak, uh, by the administration of a drug called MK801. It's these, most of these drugs were really used for proof of concept. Uh, all of them have toxic effects uh, in, in humans, but dogs, like many, Many of our experiments can tolerate these things incredibly well. Uh, and we use AMPA receptor as another type of NMDA receptor that by blocking it, you could actually see improved results in both histology as well as functional recovery of these animals. And then we started to uh, look at uh, nitric oxide and using a variety of neuronal nitric oxide synthase blockers we were able to, again, show and mitigate the effects of a two-hour hypothermic circulatory arrest on these dogs. It was actually uh, uh, one of these things you could walk in to the lab and know whether that animal was a control animal or whether there was some intervention. So it wasn't one of these that was sort of iffy. It was, it was pretty dramatic. Interestingly, I'm not gonna show you here, but. You remember, uh, many of you remember when gangliosides was such a uh, hot item many years ago, and there actually was a uh, clinical study showing that there was perhaps some improvement in patient with spinal cord injury. But actually, in our particular model, gangliosides would actually work the best. Uh, and then the problem is, is that you couldn't get them anymore. 
uh, because they were made from cow brain and they, you could, uh, gambre uh, was, a, was a side effect. Actually, we're, we're now talking with a company now who, who can synthetically make ganglicides for us to see whether or not they have the same type of uh, response as the original ones did. So the summary of the early lab experience, and again, this is over a period of 20 years, uh, was that, uh, as I pointed out, you could measure the glutamate levels pre and post uh, circ arrest, and they were definitely elevated above baseline. And, and then you could block the toxicity by the administration of MK801. As I mentioned, we used uh, auto radiography and it, it tags NMDA receptors. And in this first panel, although you can't read the legend here, uh, this is an animal that it had nothing done to it. We just sacrificed the animal, looked at the brain, and you can see that in a normal animal, the NMDA receptors in the hippo hippocampus are, are yellow in color and quite abundant. Uh, in this uh, view of the hippocampus, this is a control animal who underwent two hours of hypothermic circulatory rest, no other intervention. And you can see that virtually the NMDA receptors are wiped out. And then this is a dog that had received MK801, which is an NMDA receptor blocker. And when you block them, you preserve those NMDA receptors, and the dogs functionally and histologically definitely looked uh, significantly improved. So then, as I mentioned, uh, in looking at neuronal nitric oxide uh, synthase, uh, we were able to demonstrate citrulline, increased citrulline levels in the model following uh, ischemia, and that uh, these inhibitors actually improve neurologic function. So over the, about the last five years, uh, we became interested in, in the area of proteomics. And as I, as I mentioned to you, uh, you know, I didn't know what proteomics was. That, that was never taught in medical school or residency or anything. So this has been a great learning experience uh, working with these neuroscientists. But there's great interest, of course, in looking at whether you can identify these in, either in the serum or in the cerebral spinal fluid. And the ideal biomarker is one that you can easily measure it in either uh, serum or CSF. It can show the magnitude of injury. Uh, it uh, is present at a clinically relevant time, and it's specific to the disease. It's, it's located in the brain and for us, for our purposes. So uh, we first started looking at a group of biomarkers that are out, what are called alpha spectrum breakdown products. So alpha <coughs> two spectrum is a protein that is, makes up the skeletal uh, surface of uh, neurons. And they're, it's particularly vulnerable during ischemia or hypoxia to these two cysteine proteases, calpane and calpase. And they then are the effector arm of the injury. And they can, what I'll show you is they actually can uh, lead to, one leads to necrosis, one leads to apoptosis. And then <clears throat> when they break up the alpha spectro, spectrum products, these products can then be measured uh, uh, right now only in the CSF. So this cartoon shows, again, this accumulation of glutamate over NMDA receptors, this influx of calcium, the generation of calpane here, and then if you go all the way over, uh, the calpase is also turned on uh, in the process that then leads to apoptosis. So if you look at the breakdown products, here's schematically what happens. So under ischemia or hypoxia, uh, calpane works and breaks this component down into 150 and 145 and calpase breaks it down into 150i and 120. And you can measure these uh, in the CSF. This, uh, just to remind you what the experimental design was, uh, we <clears throat> started looking at dogs with one hour and those dogs with only cardiopulmonary bypass, measured baseline CSF, then they underwent uh, they're either one hour of hypothermic circuit stress or just cardiopulmonary bypass. 
sacrificed at eight hours, and then we had a group of them that we carried out to 24 hours. And we already had uh, a number of animals where we had data on for two hours of hypothermic circuitry rest. And so <clears throat> what you see in this slide is the breakdown products, uh, uh, biomarkers, 145 plus 150. I'm sorry, let me go back. And I can see that there is, these are baseline, this is baseline. Then after eight hours of, of uh, recovery, you can see that uh, for one hour of hypothermic circuit terrestrial, there's a significant elevation. There's a trend at uh, 24 hours. In this one of 120, you can see it's, although it's, you look like it should be, but in fact it was not statistically significant, but definitely a trend. Then if you look at just cardiopulmonary bypass, and again, this is in the cerebral spinal fluid, you can see that uh, there are no statistical difference, although again, a trend. You know, I always come back and say, well, that also sort of demonstrates that literally cardiopulmonary bypass, at least in a dog, uh, doesn't cause any significant neurologic uh, injury, in, at least in the dog. One biomarker that I think has perhaps a lot of uh, promise to it is uh, what is called ubiquitin <coughs> C-terminal hydrolase. It's a protein, and one of the advantages of it is it's specific to the brain. And it's been linked to a variety of cognitive and motor disorders in humans. Uh, and it was shown in a study uh, of patients undergoing thoracic aortic surgery, uh, again, in spinal fluid, uh, that it is elevated uh, during uh, periods during when the cross clamp is applied and ischemia is induced. So we looked at it in our model, uh, and this is CSF concentration from baseline at eight hours, whether it's uh, one hour of hypothermic circuitry rest, cardiopulmonary bypass only, or two hours, it's significantly elevated from baseline. By 24 hours, the only one that is significantly elevated is the more severe injury. And then we looked in serum, and we believe this is the first time it's been shown in serum, that with this more severe injury, we could see it in serum eight hours and then starting to tail off at 24 hours after a cardiopulmonary bypass. We did not see it in one hour and we did not see it in, in patients who, I'm sorry, in dogs that had cardiopulmonary bypass alone, but only in the more severe injury. So the proteomics story is such that uh, Alpha-2 uh, breakdown products, spectrum breakdown products, uh, I think they're, they're potential biomarkers. Uh, we haven't demonstrated them in, in serum yet, only in CSF, uh, but it's a, it is a matter of time, I think, before we'll be able to uh, show that. Uh, and if you think about it, what we would think that perhaps what you'll have is a panel of biomarkers that you'll look at as opposed to just one or two. And you'll be able to then create a way in which to know how severe the injury is. Sort of if you think about it from a practical point of view, you have someone who's slow to wake up from the ventilator. If you are able to measure biomarkers, it may give you an idea that in fact they're actually going to be just fine or they, they may not be fine. And this uh, UCHL1 uh, is, again, as I said, we're, we're measuring it uh, currently uh, in patients along with a variety of biomarkers to see both their patients, we're measuring them on all patients, including those patients undergoing hypothermic circulatory arrest. So the, the jury is still out on whether or not it'll be effective in, in patients as a, a marker of neurologic injury. So we got into genomics uh, because, as you'll see, uh, we, the, the canine genome became available. And uh, it, it actually really helped us. It was sequenced in 2005. Before that, really what you had were mice. And uh, it's pretty hard to put mice on cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, uh, but, but dogs, you can. And, and they developed these microarrays and it, it actually lended itself just at a perfect time 
uh, when we were gonna renew our grant. So it, it really worked out uh, well. And as I said, Gordon Tomaselli uh, was uh, very instrumental in, in helping us uh, be involved in the definement of this uh, microarrays for the canine model. So just again go over, we have cardiopulmonary bypass alone, one hour of hypothermic circuit arrest, and two hours of HCA. The hippocampus was sectioned uh, for microarray work because again, that's what we're particularly interested in. We know that is the area that has the most damage. We know that on, for humans, that's where memory and cognition is. And then we use the uh, uh, <clears throat> arrays for analysis. And then uh, the genes that uh, we were particularly found uh, to be either upregulated or downregulated, we confirmed and validated them by real-time PCR. Again, all of this work not done in my lab, all done <clears throat> in the Kennedy Krieger uh, lab with uh, Michael Johnston. So what are the results? Uh, if you look at genes using a false discovery rate of 10% and, and a full change of value 1.5. What that basically means is that we were conservative uh, with this. You can see that at se the dogs that were sacrificed at eight hours, one hour of hypothermic circuitry arrest, there were 49 genes that were shared uh, between one hour and two hour. And take a look at this, really only four genes were changed with just cardiopulmonary bypass alone. So at the genomic level, at least in a dog, cardiopulmonary bypass does, has very little effect on the brain. Now again, these are normal dogs. They don't have cerebral vascular disease. They don't have atherosclerosis. So, uh, but at least uh, it's the same is true with those undergoing the circuitry arrest. And then we sacrificed them at 24 hours and again, saw a diminution in the number of genes that were shared between the two hours and the one hour. And then we had no, no, no genes that were changed uh, in cardiopulmonary bypass only. The genes that turned out to be of interest uh, show were associated with cell death and survival, glutamate excitotoxicity, uh, transcription, mitochondrial function, and inflammation. Uh, were all genes that we were particularly interested in because if you look at this original cartoon, you can see that these genes are located in the areas in which we're particularly interested in and which we believe excitotoxicity has a role and a mechanism by which uh, it uh, kills neurons. So in conclusion on genomics, uh, it really was a terrific sort of window into an area that uh, we thought very promising, particularly in the models that were one hour in cardiopulmonary bypass alone, the ones that are much more applicable to clinical uh, activity. And it's possible that some of these genes could be therapeutic targets uh, in, the, in the future. So our future directions, we are in a couple areas. One is in a gas called xenon, and that, that is a, a noble gas. And if, if you remember the periodic table, uh, it, it, it is located in a column with krypton, neon, and a few more. And what, what is particularly attractive about the gas is that it is has very little uh, effect, very little uh, side effects. It's, it was used in thousands of patients in Europe, uh, and what it does do, at least in a small animal model, is inhibit NMDA receptor activity and other glutamate receptors. And in some small, again, small animal studies, reduces apoptosis. The, pro the reason why it is not used anymore is it's extremely expensive. And so we've, we've had a, a person who's done a lot of this work is uh, in England, and he has a ventilator that recycles xenon. So we have that, and we're doing some work. And the, the first couple animals that uh, we did uh, actually look pretty promising, but it's, it's, all, it's an N of two. Uh, but one of the areas, again, uh, is, is this area of dendromeres. Uh, again, uh, 
being at Hopkins, being at Stanford, one of the beauties is that you've got incredibly bright people all over the place. This fellow is a chemical engineer who works over in ophthalmology at the Wilmer, and uh, he's looking at macular degeneration. And macular degeneration probably has an inflammatory component to it. So dendromers are a, sort of, if you nanoparticles are small, dendromers are even smaller. And they're able to pass through the blood-brain barrier. And you can target them to specific cell types. Uh, they particularly, during inflammation, they home into what are called microglia, which are activated macrophages that are associated with inflammation. You can load them with fluorescent markers so you can identify them in the brain. And then one of the other uh, important things is that you can tag drugs to it. So that if you have a drug that might be systemically toxic, you can tag it to these, they'll go directly to the target and they won't go systemic. And they're particularly cleared very quickly through the hepatorenal uh, mechanism. So we've done just a couple preliminary uh, experiments, again, gearing up for uh, putting our grant back in in July. And uh, this, is, these are, this is a stain from the hippocampus. The green is a dendromere that was uh, injected uh, IV, and the pink is a dendromere that was injected through uh, the cerebral spinal fluid. So, they get into the brain, they get into the hippocampus, they, they actually attach to these activated my, uh, macrophages. So if you were to put an anti-inflammatory drug on them, you might be able to affect and mitigate the injury. So it's just an area that literally this was done uh, two weeks ago. I, I really I begged him to do it so I at least could show you here today that, that it was pretty neat stuff. Well, I'm going to switch to, to neurocognitive dysfunction at the bedside uh, because we've had a, a really uh, long-standing interest in this. Uh, uh, Guy McCann uh, is the leader of this group. Uh, many of, uh, well, some of you uh, who go back a few years uh, remember that Guy McCann trained here many years ago uh, and actually came to Hopkins and started. He was the first chair of neurology. And he and uh, Tim Gardner, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon who was at Hopkins and then went on uh, to uh, be the chief at uh, Penn, they started a collaboration uh, probably, well, before Bruce and I came. Uh, but then I got very interested in when Tim went to, uh, went to Penn to take, take over that role. And uh, we, we were very interested in this, this problem, as a lot of people are. Uh, what are these neurocognitive changes? You know, there's huge ranges of them in patients. Uh, in all, in most all uncontrolled studies, uh, our own, our own. If you measure a patient, give them a set of studies pre-op and a set of studies within a month, you can see that in about 28% of our patients, they don't do as well on those uh, studies. But as I'll show you, they go away by three months most of the time. Not always, but in the majority of the pe people. We don't know the reasons. It could be embolic load. It could be area, uh, particular hypoperfusion. It could be related to this uh, systemic inflammatory response. And all the studies that were done uh, leading up to this were all done in this sort of arbitra arbitrary way. So if you had a 20% decrease in 20% of the testing domains, then you had neurocognitive uh, deficits. So, and actually, we publish papers a lot like that, so I'm not casting stones. We just, uh, we figured out there was a better way to do it. And it was prompted by this article uh, from 2001. And that article basically said that at five years, 42% of patients who underwent cardiopulmonary bypass for coronary artery disease had neurocognitive deficits implicating the pump, basically. And that actually is what, in many ways, prompted uh, off-pump uh, coronary artery bypass surgery. So 
Guy and I talked about this. Our, we, had, we have a, a monthly uh, get together and said, you know, it just didn't make sense that one exposure to the heart-lung machine five years later would lead to neurocognitive deficits. But I, f for those of us who remember, this was significant. This paper, I mean, there were phone calls to the offices. There were, it was a spread in the New York Times. They, they called it pump head. Uh, people had pump head with this. It was really pretty dramatic. So Guy, Guy was a principal investigator. I was a co-investigator. Uh, developed this forearm non-randomized prospective study. So one group of patients uh, had cardiopulmonary bypass grafting using the pump. We had non-surgical controls. So these were patients who had documented coronary artery disease by cath. They may have had an angioplasty, but they didn't have an operation and they did not have anesthesia because anesthesia can play a role in neurocognitive dysfunction as well. And they were matched by the amount of burden they had. So diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, previous stroke, they were matched accordingly. We also matched a group uh, who underwent off pump. And then we took a group of patients who had no known risk factors for cerebral vascular disease. And the hypothesis was pretty simple. Long-term cognitive decline was more related to cerebral vascular issues and increasing age over a period of five to six years as opposed to having being put on the heart-lung machine. And we had follow-up at three months, 12 months, three years, and six years. I'm just going to show you some of the data, but not all of the data of that study. Uh, so the control arm, I, we believe this first time this, a study like this was done uh, having a control. So then you didn't have to use any of these arbitrary criteria for decline. It was a matter of comparing the patients who underwent surgery with the patients who did not undergo surgery, but yet were matched accordingly. So as you might suspect, and otherwise I wouldn't be up here telling you this story, that at three months, there was no difference between the, those two groups of patients, none. And if you look at the scores, you can see that at three months and then out at one year between controls and those patients who went conventional bypass grafting, there was virtually no difference in their studies. This, this sort of going from below to above, this, that actually has to do with, it, mostly with learning the test. As you learn, if you learn this test, you actually do a little bit better the next time. So summary, short time cognitive decline after coronary bypass grafting does occur in some patients, we know that. And sometimes for a few patients, it can be pretty bad. Uh, but most, it's gone by three months. And it is, uh, I think in general, uh, not, and not, at least in this early study, not related to cardiopulmonary bypass. So then we were able to follow them up at six years. And here are the data from six years, both at one year, at 36 months, and out at six years. You can see that there is this progressive decline in neurocognitive testing uh, in these groups of patients, but the decline is virtually the same uh, in both groups. So if you look at baseline to six years, the decline all domain is minimal, and there's no difference between the groups. If you just go from one year to six year, there's actually more of a pronounced decline, but again, no difference between the groups. So our conclusions from the study were that there, there really wasn't a selective cognitive decline associated with patients who underwent conventional coronary artery surgery with the pump. And that late decline shouldn't be considered a factor in the choice of coronary artery surgery, off pump or on pump. And that late decline is associated with cerebral vascular or cardiovascular disease and the increased age of the patients. And what we should be doing is paying much more attention, modifying risk factors after, before and after their operation and not worrying about whether they were on the heart-lung machine. So going back, Dr. Shumway always said, the pump is your friend. And uh, I want to... Uh, 
I want to end uh, my uh, talk uh, by again uh, thanking uh, Bobby for uh, inviting uh, me to give this uh, talk. Uh, I'm, I'm very honored to, to be the uh, Shumway professor. This picture was taken uh, at the 50th uh, celebration of the cross circulation uh, uh, Dr. Lillehei when Dr. Shumway was peering over the table uh, for that uh, very first operation and uh, he was given uh, an honorary degree. And I'd like to thank uh, all of you, so many of my friends are here and uh, that I've known for many, many years for coming and uh, for your kind attention. So maybe we'll take a couple of minutes for some questions. Uh, uh, any questions from the audience? Right. Herman. Bill, uh, since many of us went over from, from circles for the rest, it was uh, selective anti-grade cerebral perfusion to remote the aneurysm work. Has there been a study comparing short-term circuit rest versus uh, selective anti-grade perfusion? Not, not in this model, not yet. Uh, we, we did try uh, to uh, look at uh, retrograde uh, venous perfusion for through the superior vena cava. And uh, the dog has so many valves uh, in its system that it was all diverted uh, to the face and uh, we could not, so it wouldn't work in that. But, but you, using uh, selective uh, axillary perfusion, uh, we, would, we would, in order to do that, you have to open the chest. So we changed the model a little bit uh, in order to do that, but it's a good point. We have not done that yet. Yeah, I, I think I was thinking the same thing, so maybe you could include that in your grant application as well as uh, <clears throat> maybe some functional MRI work. That's pretty expensive, but that's, you know, that's, that's the, the problem, isn't it? Yeah. Hey. Have you uh, applied or looked at any of these, these various markers in the cerebral anoxic arrest, post-cardiac arrest? Yeah, that's it's a. It's sort of anecdotal, but I've seen some pretty dramatic results of patients who've been cooled for 24 hours who had been in the field uh, in full rest for a number of minutes. You know, it's it's a good point, Aiden, and and some of these uh, we're we're actually doing it in our patients uh, first because I'm. We saw that we were able to see these biomarkers in the serum of dogs. They, to, we're not, we don't know if you can actually see them in humans. Uh, so, in some of these. So, but it's, we're going to, and the other, we're going to do that because I think it's, it would just be an interesting, it's easy to do uh, if it's serum. Uh, but on the, on the patients who have aortic uh, and you have a spinal uh, core, you a, a, a strain in, uh, to look for on, we've got our, our guys interested in just looking at it on the CSF uh, uh, from those kind of patients who have thoracoabdominals. Okay, maybe one last question. It's a, it's a good question. We, we did. Uh, in fact, uh, we spent Jeez, we spent a year and a half uh, looking at that, at least in a dog, with two hours of hypothermic circuitry rest, we could not see any significant changes using MRI technique and diffusive, diffusion weighted imaging. I, it, we were completely um, surprised we could not demonstrate it, so at least in a dog, and, and the, other, the other interesting thing about the dog is one hour of circuitory rest uh, for these dogs, functionally, if you come in, they, this look like you gave them a haircut. I mean, they, they are uh, absolutely, and you can see in the genome, even the genomic data doesn't show all that much change in the one hour. So that's why we've used the two hour, but we could not show any change in, in, the, in the radiology effects using MRI. Okay, Bill, again, thank you very much, and thank you all for attending. Thank you. So I've oh, never thank heard you. all that work. That's great. Oh, thank Thanks, you. Uh,